morning. Welcome to our Finance Toolbox series provided by Frost Brown Todd and its affiliate FBT Project Finance Advisors and presented on CDFA TV. The title of this episode is Transportation Finance Strategies. My name is David Rogers and I am a member with Frost Brown Todd and the president of its municipal advisory affiliate, FBT Project Finance Advisors. Joining me today are Randy Bush from the Columbus Regional Airport Authority and John Egan from Frost Brown Todd. Randy is the recently retired Chief Financial Officer for the Columbus Regional Airport Authority, which operates John Glenn International, Rickenbacker International, and Bolton Field Airports in Columbus, Ohio. His area of direct responsibility with the Columbus Regional Airport Authority included property management, business process improvements, lease negotiation, accounting and financial reporting, financial and feasibility planning, treasury management, debt issuance and compliance, rating agency relationships, resource and financial planning, parking and ground transportation, and internal and external audit reviews. John is a member with Frost Brown Todd and represents the firm's clients on a variety of municipal bond and project finance issues, serving as bond counsel, underwriters counsel, or company counsel. He also serves as corporate counsel to a number of clients and advises companies on investment incentives available for new and expanded industry, including tax benefits, through taxable bond structures. He led the team at Frost Brown Todd, representing Kentucky, on the recent Louisville Southern Indiana Bridges project. Well, thank you, David. I'm glad to be here this morning um, and hope to have a great session here with, uh, with the team. Uh, we're going to use airports as a transportation asset case study. Uh, they are part of an intermodal network system of roads, seaports, airports, bridges, mass transit, trains, rental cars. The, the, there's an extensive amount of infrastructure that we're going to talk about here this morning. But first, let me give you a little bit of background about our airports. Uh, David mentioned we have three airports. Uh, the, the first airport, and there's going to be a, a picture here of John Glenn, and you'll see here it's got three primary concourses that are tied uh, to an original facility that was built in the 1950s. <clears throat> so core infrastructure there has been around for some period of time. Uh, the, the next picture is going to be a picture of the interior of John Glenn. You'll see that we've modernized the facility. We've made it nice for the community. It's a very nice airport to fly in and out of. But the infrastructure, the areas, that, in fact, there are actually core components to that building uh, that were built in the 50s that are still there in use at the airport. And all of that's going to require significant investment and upgrade here in the coming years. The second airport, you'll have the aerial view of Rickenbacker Airport which is about 4,500 acres. Uh, there's two primary runways that are there that are each over two miles long. That airport was actually an alternate site for the space shuttle to land in the event that one of the other facilities was not available. The apron areas where the aircraft park are significant. A lot of asphalt, a lot of concrete in that facility that needs to be required and maintained. So much like other major cargo hubs and other uh, facilities that uh, have or like roadways and bridges that have major infrastructure cost uh, are certainly re uh, requiring investment and improvement here in the coming years. Uh, now, certainly can't ignore what's happened this year in the transportation business. I don't think it really matters which business you're talking about, whether it's uh, on roads or whether it's on trains uh, or certainly at airports, uh, there's been a significant impact to the activities uh, in these business segments. Uh, just to give you some examples, we've got a chart here that shows the activity at John Glenn. This is our passenger activity uh, for uh, the Columbus region. And you'll see that in the month of April, our passenger activity dropped to 4%. That's 4% of what it normally is and what it would have been in 2019. So just a dramatic impact on uh, certainly the airport's business, but then businesses around the country. I've got a son that works in Manhattan. Uh, he has to take the subway system to work. 
And so he has been trying to find alternative ways, whether it be an electric bike, uh, whether it be an Uber, uh, he's, he's uh, certainly trying to find significant alternative methods in order to get to his workplace. So some significant challenges um, in when passengers are going to return is certainly unknown at this time. Uh, we think that the leisure travel <clears throat> will, excuse me, will probably come back first. Uh, that leisure travel, I think people are a little penned up. They, they would like to actually get out and do some traveling. Uh, but that travel is not going to happen until folks are comfortable being together and being close to one another, uh, whether it be in a whole room or whether it be in an airplane. So even though COVID has been um, an impact to our business, the infrastructure, the roads, the taxiways, the runways, the airport facilities are still continuing to age. And so we've got to continue to stay focused on the replacement of this aging infrastructure. Even though we've had a, a downtick in passenger activity, uh, we know that that'll return. We know it will come back. It's just a matter of timing and when that will happen. So let me share a couple methods or a couple ways that airports are funded. How do we generate our cash? and it's really tied to users of our facilities. Uh, there's really two forms of cash that we have. Uh, it's either a regulated form of cash or an unregulated form of cash. We've actually got a slide to help break some of this down so that you can see this easily uh, on the screen. But in our regulated cash, we have passenger facility charges. Those charges are fees that are collected from customers on their airline ticket. And those fees are then collected by the airlines and remitted back to the airport to pay for infrastructure. And that's exactly how we use those dollars. But think about it, COVID having a strong impact on users of the airport and folks buying tickets, it's had a dramatic impact on the amount of passenger facility charges that are collected. We also receive grants, uh, some grants, whether those be federal, state or local grants, but those again are tied to infrastructure only. Up until this year, airports had never received any form of grant really for paying of, of operating expenses. The CARES funds this year have certainly been helpful for airports to be able to manage through this reduction in activity that we're experiencing. Uh, but largely uh, airports have received federal funding, federal grants to help pay for infrastructure related to airports. But again, it's not a big number. Uh, then we have another item, it's called customer facility charges. This is a charge that's actually assessed against rental car transactions, but only for rental car activities. And it's only applied to infrastructure that relates uh, to rental car transactions and rental car customers. <clears throat> the last and probably the most important is our relationship with the airlines. The airlines provide a significant investment in airports across this country. And those relationships are very, very important uh, to airports all across the country. Uh, so those uh, rental revenues that we receive from the airlines and those fees for actually operating at the airport are a key regulated component at airports in, in the form of cash. The unregulated pieces that many people don't realize uh, are our parking and our ground transportation revenues our terminal concessions and advertising inside the terminal buildings. We have a large real estate function at the airport where people will actually rent space uh, from the airport. And then certainly general aviation activity at the airport is very strong. Uh, it, in, it would include corporate aircraft, it would include private aircraft, and those folks that uh, need a place for their plane to be parked at airports. Uh, let's spend a minute on capital infrastructure. <clears throat> Certainly a challenge for many transportation agencies as their passenger activity has dropped and their ability to pay uh, their debts. Uh, a lot of our bonds that we issue at the airport are considered revenue bonds, which means that the revenue of the airport is the sole source of repayment for those bonds. And when we see a drop in passenger activity in both forms of that cash, we're gonna see an impact on the, the airport's ability uh, to be able to repay its bonds. <clears throat> so 
So each of those forms that we talked about earlier have been impacted by COVID. And you know, we've got a number of uh, opportunities at the airport to help with financing of infrastructure. And we just talked about revenue bonds, uh, but we can also issue short-term financing. We can issue revolving credit facilities, commercial paper programs, certainly uh, direct private placement programs where we have individually with banks, uh, conduit fin financing to help some of our on-airport tenants who are working at the airport, and then certainly public-private partnerships that have been coming on very strong here in the last decade or so uh, to help finance um, uh, activities at the airport. We've also got a slide showing the number of forms of public-private partnerships. They are vast, uh, and, and each one can be very specific or very unique uh, in, in the type of use uh, that uh, you may need in your uh, financing activities. So it doesn't matter which form of activity or, or revenue financing that you pick up, uh, here at airports and in many facilities, it's gonna be the repayment of those uh, facilities are gonna be based on customers and those folks who use the facilities. So for example, uh, we issued bonds at the airport to help uh, construct a new consolidated rental car facility. That facility was committed for uh, the repayment of its bonds by the use of the CFCs or the customer facility charges with a backstop from the rental car companies themselves. So some creative financing that we've used for the operations, but the rental car companies certainly are being very, very cautious about their finances. And so we're doing all that we can to make sure that we are leveraging the very minimum CFCs to repay that debt. But user activity is having a significant impact on airports around the country in their ability to repay uh, for that infrastructure. Now, key partnerships are, are gonna be important. We've got airlines that are gonna to have to be kept up to speed. Uh, at the airport, we've been meeting with the airlines on a monthly basis to let them know what's happening within our region and within uh, the airport and its finances to let them know the airport's being a strong partner. They have backstopped some of that debt on the part of airports. And so we wanna be great partners with them and make sure that they're well aware of, the, of uh, what's happening at airports. So here's some of our solutions, and we'll talk more about this in our Q&A, but we need to get people moving and traveling again. That's gonna be the bottom line. We've gotta get folks comfortable being next to each other. Uh, that will happen likely with a vaccine. Uh, how quickly that will happen, uh, we're, we're estimating that there will be some return to travel here in 2021, especially with the vaccine coming on board. But the return of business travel, is certainly unknown. I think folks have learned how to uh, do business differently. And so until their competition or their folks who uh, they're competing with are uh, returning to travel, it could be a little slower response on the part of those uh, companies before they get back in the air again or whether they get back on uh, trains or, or whatever it is that they use as, as a way to get to their customers. It's just gonna take a, a little while before that happens. Now, there's been a lot of conversation in Washington about uh, infrastructure and an infrastructure bill. I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but that's gonna be key as well to many of the organizations that are listening. Uh, the, the infrastructure bills uh, are gonna be key to keeping airports and other types of bridges and roadways uh, certainly functioning at their, at their best capacity. The other item that I think we need is a strong financial plan. Uh, airports in, in particular, we've had a number of challenges through the years, uh, whether it be 9-11, uh, that terrible day, whether it be a recession, whether it be airline bankruptcies. Airports have been accustomed to having very difficult times through the years. Uh, we need to build strong financial plans so that we are prepared and that we are ready for those, that means we've got to have a strong cash position. That means that we've got to have a relatively modest level of debt that we can manage within our facilities because we know that there's going to be a downturn. It's just a matter of when. And so strong financial planning is certainly key. And then certainly to other governmental entities and airports and transportation agencies, 
we've just got to really maintain a strong relationship with our partners and those folks that we do business with uh, are, are, are like our airlines at airports, the rental car companies, uh, the local communities, our local constituents, national, uh, state level, all of those uh, relationships become very, very important as we talk about the replacement of aging infrastructure at our airports. So I'll, I'll pause there and, um, and uh, see what, what else needs to be uh, shared. Thank you. Uh, Randy, you mentioned uh, public-private partnerships, so-called P3s. Have you uh, used many P3s or considered P3s for financing infrastructure assets so far at the airports? Great question. Yes, we have considered it. We've not actually moved forward with an actual P3 project at the airport, but we did consider there were some investors who were interested. Uh, I think as we got into the further details of the program and of the project, uh, we found that it, it uh, was going to be a better fit for us to move forward with the financing. But I, but I do know that there are a number of airports who have found that very, very helpful across the country. Um, well, a follow-up question would be, do you think there's more or less opportunity now for using P3s in the, for transportation infrastructure, not just airports, but bridges and roads? Uh, with the downturn in travel, does that mean that the typical solutions are going to be ones that people look at, or are they going to be looking at P3s more? What do you think? I think P3s are going to be looked at more. Um, there, there are a number of P3s that folks are watching right now, whether it be, and again, these are in various forms, but whether it's LaGuardia's airport and the terminal uh, reconstruction that they've got going on there, or whether it's out in Denver or whether it's LA, there, there are a number of P3 projects that folks are watching right now that I think are gonna become uh, very interesting to, uh, to move forward with as uh, folks, but you, you've gotta have the right deal, you've gotta have the right program to put it together. Uh, certainly the, the, the equity firm needs to have its return on its investment. And so I think when you, when you can couple that and find the right project, I think there will be broader interest here in the future. Um, John, I think you may have had a question regarding federal funding and TIFIA. Sure, thank you, David. So, you know, TIFIA is a critical and important tool for financing transportation projects. Um, and in the example of the Louisville Southern Indiana Bridges project, it made up about 24% of the total funding. It was a variety of sources. It was in that case, uh, the in the Kentucky case, it was used with revenue bonds, total revenue bonds, which were a first lien bond. The TIFIA uh, program, which were separate and but important because it's those are subordinate to the first lien revenue bond so they in effect they fill the gap and they do a serve an important uh, function by doing that guardy bonds was another source uh, of revenue and then the revenues of the um, from the commonwealth of kentucky met match of federal and state taxes uh, all those different sources were used together so so I, sort of a related question, I'll bounce back to you, David, is you know, what, what do we think will happen during the next four years? If they're assuming that uh, President-elect Biden is born in a January Biden administration, what sort of role do we think TIFIA will play over the next four years with important uh, projects that the federal government's involved with? Well, uh, Randy can jump in too, but uh, TIFIA has been a, a source of funding that's worked well, and even uh, over the, the last four years with the administration with no new major infrastructure bills, uh, private activity bonds have also been available uh, to fill some of that gap. We know from the sources from the Biden uh, president-elect transition team that there's conversation about a, a major infrastructure bill uh, and I would think that TIFIA and other sources that are already in place are the ones that are going to be used uh, because likely to have a Republican-controlled Senate. But the good news is that traditional Republican uh, views, as well as the original proposals from the Trump campaign in 2016, uh, concentrated on infrastructure as, as a way to rebuild not only the needed uh, bridges, roads, and other transportation sources in the United States, 
but also as a way to get people back to work. So uh, odds are we're hearing from all the different sources, including our friends who are Republican members of the Senate and the House, that these programs are going to continue and get funded more. It's just a question of timing. And that that's, it, it, you know, you, you waiting on the federal government is something people have done for a long time. Randy, I presume you guys have waited as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great point there, David. I know there is a national focus right now on trying to broaden TIFIA and the usage of TIFIA at airports. Uh, right now, the the um, the type of project is somewhat limited, and so we're trying to get that uh, language broadened. And there's actually a, a subcommittee uh, nationally of other CFOs around the country who are currently working today to try to get that language updated so that we can kind of expand that for airports. But that may be a key step even for other types of infrastructure projects and infrastructure uh, um, needs across the country. So you have successfully used uh, uh, revenue bonds to finance some of your facilities, Randy. And as uh, John and I well know, tax exempt revenue bonds are a traditional source of financing. Uh, and what those bonds usually do is finance the capital facilities, but not the ongoing maintenance costs in the future. Uh, do you think that uh, given the downturn in the recession and, and the uncertainty about future maintenance costs, that tax exempt debt will continue to be used or will there be some hybrids potentially layering in a public private partnership? I definitely see a hybrid. Uh, I think there'll be some components of projects that will be done uh, that that are going to be done with tax exempt financing. There'll be pieces of it that, you know, maybe you carve out a parking facility or you, you carve out a rental car facility, something where uh, there, there is some type of revenue return that can help that public private partnership work. Um, and that could be the same with tolls. Uh, I would imagine toll roads and similar type of infrastructure projects uh, where, uh, but, there, but there could be like, like a runway. There's not a lot of uh, public-private partnership unless you're gonna really outsource the entire airport, uh, maybe then it works, but just to do a piece for a runway, that's a great project for a tax exempt bond to be issued and really keep that cost low for the carriers. Because at the end of the day, the airlines are helping to pay for that debt. And so you wanna really provide the lowest cost option for them so that they're not incurring higher interest costs. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we know from our experience uh, at, uh, at our firm, John and I know that sometimes there have been proposals by even the international investors in public-private partnership transactions to participate in transactions where tax-exempt bond debt may be issued either to monetize an asset, which is a transportation asset, uh, not so much airports, more often parking facilities, and mm -hmm. where the investors would consider investing in the bonds because there may be a mixture of taxable and tax exempt bonds. Uh, but uh, I think one thing we can advise the people who are watching us today is the label public private partnership means lots of things. If you think about that earlier slide, there are Investors who have wanted to invest, for example, in different kinds of infrastructure who have said, okay, you won't let me invest in it yet. I'll take over the operations. And right. some of the laws are not that terrible so that people can actually operate the facility, the private person can operate the facility. And then they wanna have, if they can get it, an option to potentially acquire a long-term lease on the asset. And as mm -hmm. has been pointed out in other presentations, none of these structures ever actually transfer ownership of the transportation asset to the private investor. It's a long-term lease, certainly for state law purpose with the ability of the state or the Columbus Regional Airport Authority or anyone else to get the property back if it's not being operated in a way that's usual. Um, John, I know you had wondered about the fact that uh, California is planning on ending the sale of gasoline and diesel powered vehicles for normal transportation. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, California has been, you know, trying to move in a more uh, environmentally uh, protective uh, direction for years in various ways, and has proposed uh, outlining outlawing uh, sale of diesel and gas-powered vehicles uh, 
I think it's out about 20, 20 years. Uh, if that were to in fact happen, uh, that, that would certainly impact the production of vehicles across the country because California is such a big part of the market. Um, it's interesting, I mean, it's hard to predict whether that in fact comes to pass, but one of the things it does sort of make me think about is the fact when you've got financing that's based on revenues, uh, such as in an airport deal or a bridges deal, uh, and gasoline tax revenues in the case of a bridge, um, you know, that might move the needle a little more toward the P3, the availability payment direction, where really in that case, it's the state, which is on the hook. The state collects the revenues and it, in turn, is on the hook for making availability payments to the concessionaire, whoever the ultimate lender is. So um, it just interesting also, Randy, you mentioned some of your deals, which are revenue back by some backstop. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways, an availability payment is closer to that. It's not a pure revenue obligation. It's not a, a bridge which only collects total revenues. It's a something which is getting total revenues and then there's another backstop. The availability payment is even, uh, I say, providing more uh, security in some ways to the ultimate lender uh, because it's it's the lender who's collecting the revenues and who's on the hook for making the payments. Any comment on that, David or or Randy? Well, I know that uh, just having purchased an all-electric vehicle, I pay a little extra registration fees, but I certainly did the math in the business that we're in to determine that uh, my tax credit and the uh, federal tax credit for that vehicle would more than offset the higher registration and, and not having to buy gas would more than offset the higher registration fees. So uh, state legislatures haven't gone to, to find alternative sources of revenue for the gas tax. So that obviously needs to be managed. Um, I know that people do love to drive cars. Several years ago, working on uh, the uh, $500 million, the Ohio State University public-private partnership concession for their parking facilities, mm -hmm. I said to the treasurer of Ohio State, will cars be around in 50 years? This was in 2012. And he said, well, you graduated from the university almost 40 years ago and they're still here, David. And I said, yes, you're right. I imagine they will be. And so I think there's gonna be lots of vehicles that are traveling. We just need to figure out ways to capture the revenue. I had another question for all three of us, which is the fact that I know that when we think of airports and we think of uh, toll bridges and major transportation facilities, there are large dollar amount of financings. Even your even your rental car facility was was a large dollar amount. Do we think that the smaller transportation assets that need to be rebuilt, like small bridges, just repairing roadways and things like that, are ever ever going to go to a P3 or hybrid P3 structure, or are or are they going to be left uh, to be financed with you know for typical roadways that don't have tolls taxes? Is that the is that where we're going to be stuck for a while for smaller projects, say 25 million or less? You know, David, I think that um, it's it's tougher to finance the smaller projects uh, with P3 in some ways because. The, the cost, there is a cost in setting up the financing structure. Uh, one possibility is you may see projects being bundled. Uh, say a state has a number of different uh, bridge or transportation projects. Uh, instead of having, you know, $25 million, one $25 million project, you may be able to put together four different uh, $25 million projects and attract a greater interest from uh, investors who would be interested in doing the P3. Uh, one way of doing it. Randy, any thoughts? Not on roads and bridges. I'm, I'm certainly out of my uh, league on roads and bridges, but yeah, definitely, I, I do think that the smaller projects are more difficult to leverage uh, in a public-private partnership. Um, that would be certainly true at the airport, uh, but you know that that doesn't mean that it's it's a no, and it it doesn't mean that you know you can't 
uh, combined, as, as John has described, multiple projects together that may be part of one larger program to help try to make that a, a more interesting or, or more enticing type of P3 uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you, Randy and John, for joining us today and giving us your insight on transportation infrastructure finance. This video was provided by Frost Brown Todd and its affiliate FBT Project Finance Advisors and presented on CDFA TV.